Tonight, it's been a week of figures and high finance at Stormont as the new executive gets to grips with the money it needs to move Northern Ireland forward. But even if our politicians manage to unlock the £3.3 billion package, are we still heading for a financial cliff edge in 2026? Sir Robert Choate worries we could be. Does that mean Stormont has to raise more money locally? We'll hear why some MLAs believe a sharp rates hike isn't the answer. And our panel of experts will assess what revenue raising might mean and how this standoff could be resolved. The financial package to help restore devolution involved some very big numbers and was greeted as an opportunity to get Northern Ireland back on its feet. But a report published today by a budgetary watchdog has suggested it might only be a short-term fix. Sir Robert Choate is the chair of the Fiscal Council and he's with me now in the studio. Welcome to you and thank you for uh, joining us. Your report talks about a financial cliff edge that's coming down the tracks for Northern Ireland. Just explain why that's your assessment, first of all. Well, there are various components to this financial package and they add up in different ways across the years. So there's a reasonably large chunk of money this year, around £850 million, pounds, which uh, will help deal with the public sector pay announcements that have been made to get, uh, today. Uh, over the next couple of years, uh, slightly smaller but still substantial sums, about £750 million pounds in each of those two years. But then it drops away quite sharply to £320 million in the following year. So that creates creates quite a lot of pressure uh, for the executive to take action on revenue raising, uh, other budget savings, perhaps public service reform in order to make that a sustainable path over the medium term. So that is the cliff edge that you're talking about. And at the moment it is there, you've identified it. And the only way presumably that London thinks that that can be dealt with is for Stormont to begin the process of thinking about reasonable revenue raising. Is that also how you see it? It's true. Actually, there's an additional uh, incentive or, or importance around the revenue raising decision because some of the money that comes up in 2025-26 could be taken back uh, if the executive doesn't have a, a budget plan which includes uh, essentially the amount of money that you would get from a 15% increase in the rates or from some other source. Uh, and if that doesn't happen, then the money that the Treasury has loaned the executive essentially to cover the overspend last year and part of the overspend this year, they would demand back. Uh, what that means effectively is that the block grant will be reduced by about £550 million pounds in 2025-26. So the cliff edge you mentioned a moment ago moves one year earlier and makes the challenge for the executive all that more difficult. And obviously the Treasury and the NIO uh, would make the case that for revenue raised to the tune of about £113 million, pounds, which happens to be 15% regional rate rise, you get a dividend of £550 million. Pounds. The question is, if that money is not raised, does the £550 million pounds not appear? Is that debt rot not written off by the Treasury? That's certainly the implication. Do you think that actually would happen in reality? Well, that is the implication. I mean, what's not clear, the, the deal uh, document says that you need to have a convincing plan that has been announced, that starts to be implemented, and that it should include that revenue increase. What's not clear is exactly, uh, you know, what are the criteria that would decide whether you get over the line on that, who would actually make the decision, presumably the Treasury itself. So, obviously, there's still some uncertainty as to exactly how this uh, conditionality, the, the strings attached to this bit of the deal would actually operate. Yeah, so there's a honeymoon period now um, and this fledgling executive can begin to put uh, the finances of Northern Ireland back together again. Um, the question is if it is prepared to actually engage in a process of, of what the Treasury might see as reasonable revenue raising. Now, given the fact that the Treasury has already said that Northern Ireland ought to be funded on a needs basis and that means that it ought to be receiving further monies in future, can you understand why Northern Ireland politicians, particularly um, uh, leading figures in the executive, are saying that the, those two notions effectively cancel each other out? On the one hand, the Treasury is saying, you know, we know we need to pay you more, we know we haven't paid you enough, but if you don't do something about it, we're going to actually penalise you in the years ahead. 
Yes, well, the, the oddity about the package is that in addition to this short-term uh, financial support, which is essentially to stabilise the current budget crisis, there's another element to it, which means that in the longer term, uh, the amounts of money that come to the executive in the block grant every time that the UK government raises spending uh, in England, in the rest of the UK, that would now be topped up by an additional 24%, uh, which is reflective of uh, an estimate that we produced last year of the amount of extra spending per head you need to do in Northern Ireland to deliver roughly the same sort of public service quality and quantity as you would get uh, in the rest of the UK. That, that uh, mechanism will get you closer over time to that level of, uh, of additional funding that Northern Ireland would quote unquote need, uh, but it doesn't get you there straight away. So that's the, the oddity of the money up front, the promise of top ups to the block grant increases in the longer term, but then this gap in the middle, which is the, uh, which is the area of greatest difficulty for the executive. Yeah, I don't want to draw you into a political cat fight, and, and I'm sure you won't get drawn into that, but when you describe it as an oddity as far as the deal is concerned, uh, am I reading too much into it to um, draw the conclusion that you think it is strange and that maybe, maybe both sides, but certainly maybe the Treasury needs to sit down and look at the reasonableness or otherwise of what is on the table? Yes, I think the Treasury would take the view that there is enough scope for saving for additional revenue raising, that it's not unreasonable to say, well, we are going to provide some short-term budget support to the executive, but over the longer term, they really do need to take some decisions around revenue, around public service reform, around finding savings that most governments in most places are having to uh, look for, uh, and that therefore having this cliff edge still leaves the executive with some time to make progress in those areas. I think what some other people would say, even if they didn't disagree with the principle of this, is, is that two-year time horizon simply too short, realistically, to expect the executive to have uh, managed to achieve enough to smooth out the path and get the public finances back to a sustainable... Yeah, and, and you will have heard, and certainly we have heard here in Northern Ireland, our politicians saying a lot um, in recent days and weeks that um, there is a cost-of-living crisis and that for all sorts of historical reasons, which I think you you take on board in your report published today. There are um, specific circumstances here which mean that there are, there is perhaps a greater need in this part of the UK than there is elsewhere and it is very difficult and would be very painful for people to be um, landed with additional charges at a time like this. Yes, I mean, there is that question, obviously, around the impact on household finances. And as you say, inflation has been very high in the recent past, and obviously people are feeling the squeeze on that. The challenge for the executive, of course, is if they don't uh, inflict that pain on households, then you lose uh, a multiple of that amount of money, and that has an impact on households through what you can do with public services. So it's not a, a straightforward uh, a choice between something that uh, has an impact on households and something that doesn't. Both of those courses of action would have an impact for households of different forms. Um, the government is clearly asking why taxpayers in Great Britain should be required to subsidise public services for citizens here in Northern Ireland. And um, senior figures in London, on and off the record, have been making that point repeatedly in recent days. Is that a reasonable question to be asking? Well, the UK government has for decades accepted the fact that it's reasonable for funding per head to be higher in Northern Ireland and also in the other devolved uh, administrations in Scotland and Wales than in England for a combination of reasons, including the relatively rural population, number of people on benefits, number of uh, older people and younger people, and obviously specifically in the case of Northern Ireland rather than the other two, the need for more spending on policing and justice given the uh, unique political and security security positions. Now, there's a lot of debate about exactly how much additional funding that requires. Is this 24% number, which we would be the first to admit was a relatively broad bush estimate based on the deal that was done for uh, Wales some time ago, is that too high, too low, uh, roughly the might amount? But the UK government has always accepted the principle that it is reasonable to have public spend or funding for higher levels of public spending per head in Northern Ireland than it is in England. Yeah. Um, now, just briefly, there does seem to be a bit of a discrepancy here as well, because the UK government, as far as I understand it, is saying that that, that funding at the level of 124 will come on board very quickly. But I think there are also suggestions that it could be the middle of the next decade, in the mid-2030s, before, in fact, Northern Ireland receives monies at that kind of level. Which, in your view, is it? 
Well, uh, part of the problem here is that we don't know exactly how this mechanism is going to work, and that's something that the Treasury and the Department of Finance uh, here uh, are going to have to negotiate. But if you have a situation when it's only the new money that comes along into the block grant that's topped up by 24% rather than the whole sum moved to 24% above the level in England, then that transition is relatively slow. And as you say, could on some estimates, if we're starting, say, at 20, 21% uh, above English levels of spending, getting to 24 could take you uh, a few years. But that will depend on a number of other factors, including the relative speed with which the population grows in Northern Ireland and in England, uh, which actually, in relative terms, is beneficial for Northern Ireland because the population will be growing less quickly here, so a given amount of money has to be spread between fewer people. Yeah. It's far from straightforward. There are a lot of plates spinning in this uh, conversation tonight. For now, um, Sir Robert, thanks very much indeed for joining us. Um, now, of course, any decisions to raise revenue or implement cuts are for local politicians to take. So let's hear from two MLAs who sit on Stormont's Finance Committee, Sinn Féin's Deirdre Hargey and the Alliance Party's Owen Tennyson. Welcome to both of you and thanks um, for joining us. Uh, Deirdre Hargey, first of all, how concerned are you at the Fiscal Council's report and what Sir Robert's saying about a coming cliff edge in a couple of years' time? Well, I think we spoke about this yesterday, actually, at the Finance Committee. It's not a surprise. It's something that we have been saying very clearly. And I think what has happened um, before Christmas and subsequently after with the establishment of the Assembly is that the British government have conceded that they have underfunded our public finances here for years. Um, that now urgently needs to be rectified and the British government need to come to the table um, with a financial package that puts us on a sustainable footing. So I think what the Council's report has said this morning echoes really the calls of all the political parties here. And I'm glad that we united around that last week in the Assembly, calling on the British government to work with us to ensure that we do get a fair financial package that meets the need here, that they've recognised themselves that we have been underfunded, but they also look at a sustainability plan going forward, and we are all united in that front. Can, can you understand though why someone like Chris Heaton-Harris is asking why taxpayers in his constituency in England should be required to subsidise public services for citizens here in Northern Ireland? Well, citizens here pay their taxes also, Mark, and I think one of the other big questions um, that we need to look at in discussions with the Treasury is looking at the additional financial levers um, that can be transferred here, um, that we can then look at progressive um, tax raising powers and progressive policies as well. How can we grow a rate base? I know the Economy Minister will be setting out his plans on Monday in the Assembly in terms of how we grow the local economy. We have had conversations around childcare, for example. If we invest in childcare, we can make savings further down the line. That will help grow the economy as well. It will allow people to go out to work. So for me, there are the conversations that we want to get involved in. We need the Treasury and the British government and Chris Heaton Harris to urgently get round the table with the First and Deputy First Ministers, the Finance Minister, to really have an agreed package and programme of work going forward. You don't think there's a contradiction between, on the one hand, local politicians saying uh, we're not prepared to, for example, even talk about a revenue raising in terms of the, uh, the regional rate. We're not prepared to do that. But you want tax varying powers to increase income tax? No, I think we need all of the levers at our par in order to You're make these decisions. You're not prepared to use any of the levers that are no. currently what, within your remit. What we are, well, what we're saying is, firstly, we have been underfunded for years. That has been uh, conceded to by the British government. They need to come to the table in a progressive way to ensure that they rectify the underfunding to firstly get our uh, services on a firm financial footing. Okay. I think we also need to look, we have looked at this, that's why in the last mandate, Conor Murphy set up the Fiscal Commission and the Fiscal Council, because we do take these issues seriously. We recognise that we need to make reforms but we also have, need to have a sustainability plan going forward. Okay. We need the levers in order to do that. I think there's huge opportunities with the protocol, with the Windsor framework. We have dual market access. If we can get it right in terms of growing our rate base, that will bring more money into the local economy. If we can look at huge barriers like childcare, invest into saving services going forward, allowing people to get out to work, that's a progressive economy that doesn't penalise workers and low-income families, but actually invests okay. in them. All right, Owen Tennyson, first of all, does revenue raising need to be part of this conversation? 
Of course, but it is one small element of this conversation. I mean, the biggest determinant of our public finances here in Northern Ireland is decisions that are made at Westminster and our funding formula. And we have been contending for many years now with 14 years of austerity, with a Brexit that has damaged the economy and kamikaze deci decisions around the budget at Westminster. So that is the biggest determinant of the, the financial position that we are now in. We argued for a long time that Northern Ireland was underfunded relative to need. And I've been in studios like this before and been told that our arguments were pie in the sky. It is significant that following the negotiations that all of the parties engaged in with government, th that they have conceded that Northern Ireland has in fact been underfunded and conceded that principle. But there is now work to do in terms of bottoming that out and ensuring that the funding formula that is being proposed actually delivers funding that is relative to need, that is sufficient to fund equivalent public services in Northern Ireland right. to other parts of the UK. That okay, is simply an you, argument about be, equality. All right, just to be absolutely clear, you, you were in the room during these negotiations. Can I be absolutely clear? Because the UK government says very, very clearly, uh, has said it publicly, and if you talk to people privately, they're very clear about this as well. There was an element of conditionality in terms of the £3.3 .3 billion package that was put on the table, and nobody was in any doubt about that. And I've been told that repeatedly in the past week to 10 days. Yeah. Now, you were in the room. Yeah. W was revenue raising part of the package, is it conditional on the £3.3 billion the package? Government, There's a simple answer to that, yes or no. The government presented a paper which said that a condition of having the debt forgiveness as part of the package, there would have to be a budget sustainability plan, which would include an element of revenue raising. So, I so think all of there. the parties, clear that it was there. all of the parties were under that understanding. Right. But where government are being disingenuous is the scale, nature and timing of what it is that they're asking for. They're asking the executive to re raise an unreasonable amount of money in an unrealistic it's per time perfectly frame. possible to do and it if you increase mean, the regional well, rate. Mark, you could increase the regional rate now by 15%. That would bring in, well, funny enough, clear. exactly £113 that's, million. Pounds. And then there's a debt forgiveness, as Sir Robert Chote has just explained, a debt forgiveness for that £113 million in the region of £550 million. Well, we need to be clear as to whether this is an argument about punitive measures that would hurt the people of Northern Ireland or whether this is about budget sustainability because you simply cannot have both. I mean, if we rush to increase the regional rate at something like 15%, that would place huge pressure on households and businesses who have been struggling with increasing costs over the past two years. It would damage our economy and that would set back any potential for us to have sustainable public finances. So we need to do this in a progressive and fair way. And it is right that we have a conversation about all of the levers, including transformation of public services, dealing with the cost of division, and also looking at additional powers so that we can raise money in a progressive okay. way, looking at issues like, for example, stamp duty and landfill tax, which can be done in a progressive way and actually have an environmental incentive. I am up for that conversation. Okay. But what I'm not prepared to do is simply heap pressure on my constituents without a clear plan to say that that will actually improve outcomes. OK, so you've both had a chance to set out your stalls. I'll come back to you in just a moment or two. But let, let's just pause for a second, because you were both in the briefing uh, for the Finance Committee where you heard from the Permanent Secretary, Neil Gibson, at the department um, yesterday. Um, after the meeting, Darren Marshall caught up with some of the other MLAs on the Finance Committee. Matthew O'Toole, Chair of the Finance Committee. Are you any clearer on this £113 million revenue raising requirement? The short answer is no. I mean, the Permanent Secretary came in front of the committee today and to be fair to him, he answered our questions in full, but I'm no clearer on what's actually been agreed with the UK government, whether and when these new charges are going to be imposed on the people of the North. But it is clear, it is clear from what the Permanent Secretary said, that revenue raising was discussed the entire time in the talks between the UK government and the executive parties. It's clear that that was on the table the entire time. So people who pretend uh, that it wasn't clear are being uh, somewhat disingenuous. So I think the time is now to be clear with the people of Northern Ireland about what has actually been agreed, but also what the plan is for rescuing public services. So which areas should the executive focus on if it is to raise any additional revenue? I do think sl slapping people in the middle of a cost of living crisis with charges while public services are still uh, in chaos would not be acceptable. But if the finance minister has a plan in conjunction with the rest of the executive ministers that isn't imposing unnecessary upfront charges on people, then they should have the courage to come forward with it and they should be specific about how that's going to be used to improve public services. They want to bring plans around revenue raising, First of all, they should be honest with people about what they've agreed and whether they've made those promises to the UK Are government. you suggesting they're not being honest? Well, what I'm suggesting is clearly there's a lack of clarity. I'm not suggesting dishonesty, but I am suggesting confusion and contradiction, and I think that's obvious. There's they weren't confusion. across every jot and tittle of this, what, what no. they... What may be an agreement? That's your phrase, or I think it's Arlene Foster's phrase, or who said it? But but clearly that uh, clearly the, the, the detail has has not been 
um, hasn't been nailed down, and that was clear from the, from the committee meeting we had today. I think that the most important thing that we're noting coming forward out of it after repeated calls from our party over the past year is the recognition that the Northern Ireland funding package um, needs to be addressed and I think that the questions that's come back from the Finance Minister need to be answered as a matter of priority and our Finance Committee support that and until we get those answers there's not much more that we can really commit to moving forward. Is the DUP willing to accept any form of revenue raising? at the end of this process? Well, as I say, the funding package for Northern Ireland is the priority here. They have recognised that we need to be based on need here and they haven't committed to applying that retrospectively to the 21 forward. Um, given that they haven't done that, that has left us that we have been underfunded by hundreds of millions and our starting position going forward is not the correct base. So that needs to be addressed. Was your party across every jot and tittle of this package? Well, our party has worked really hard um, over the past number of years on getting the best deal for Northern Ireland moving forward. Um, uh, Gavin Robinson spoke clearly on this this morning as well. And um, we have led the way. We have led the way on the assessment of the funding package. And we are indicating clearly that we need to be further work on it. Was the £113 million news to you when it arrived yesterday? Well, the £113 million has come through in this letter. Um, the Finance Minister has addressed this, that she is looking for clarity on this and the entire executive needs clarity on what the agreement needs to be going forward. A lot of questions remain unanswered. Uh, there was suggestions and emphasis placed on the fact that revenue raising was mentioned in various meetings, different meetings, um, but no clarity on what was agreed. No clarity certainly asked the question of whether parties pushed back on the question of resisting water charges, resisting prescription charges and other measures that I, um, our party emphasise are anti-working class measures. So a lot of questions that were asked today, but really uh, myself and, and others in the public really are on the ways of what actually was agreed by the executive parties and the, the Tory government. Some people would say 113 million is a small price to pay for 3.3 billion. Well, it's playing the Tories game. I don't think the executive should play the Tory game. And the fact that the First Minister and Deputy First Minister have pushed back on some of those measures is a welcome thing. To be frank, the reason they've done it is they've looked over their shoulder and they've seen a public sector strike uh, of 170,000 workers not so long ago. And I think they're very, very concerned that this new Shiny executive doesn't proceed down a path of economic uh, war on, on people. So they're very concerned and they know the public mood on these measures. So uh, I think they should be focused on pushing back and not implementing that agenda and I think that would be something that would be beneficial to the delays of ordinary working class people. So that's a snapshot of what some of your fellow committee members made of yesterday's uh, meeting up at Stormont. Can we just talk about, about water charges? Because that's um, the introduction of water charges is something that could raise up to £350 million. The UK government says the average rates bill in Northern Ireland in 2021-2022 was £1,036. It was about 150 more in Scotland, 300 more in England and 500 more in Wales. But on top of that, households in the three other nations faced additional bills of in and around £400 for water water and sewage costs. There was no additional charge here. Is that not a compelling case for charging for water, in your view? Well, I think we've been very clear, and the First Minister has reiterated the point this week, that we will not make any decision to introduce water charges. And I think there is support across the executive um, in terms of that issue. And is that because you're worried what, about uh, the general election in the Republic of I Ireland? I think this has been a long-standing view, um, that we don't want to penalise the public I think uh, what has happened with the £130 million figure is really a distraction from the key issue in that we have been underfunded for years now within our public services. That needs to be rectified. We want to look at a long-term sustainability plan, but you don't on the one hand say that we've underfunded you, then on the other hand say we want you to pay more for services that we've underfunded. You have to look at a longer-term sustainability plan. We have to look at the additional financial levers. As I say, 
said, we have a huge opportunity here, Mark, in terms of growing the economy, investing in local enterprise and businesses, using the advantages of the protocol and the Windsor framework, okay. which gives us that dual market access, which can actually grow and bring the rate base up here, in which we can then use that money to invest in public services more okay. and actually to change those services for the better. Um, Owen Tennyson, doesn't devolution give politicians um, in places like Northern Ireland an opportunity to make decisions for themselves. So if you don't want to introduce water charges, which would raise £350 million, there is, a, there is a price to pay for that. There is a calculation. If you decide, if politicians here decide that um, prescription charges should be free, um, then that costs £20 million. You have to factor that into your overall annual costs. The same thing for domiciliary care, £32 million you know, is what it costs to provide that free of charge. Um, if, if you want to look at factories getting a 70% discount on their rates, that costs £70 million. Um, tuition fees being less here than they are across the water costs £90 million. That's absolutely fine if you want to offer those services at that price for people here. But you have to make a calculation based on that. And we don't seem to be prepared to do that. Well, we are, but this is the, this is the key point. The UK government is trying to run a coach on horses through the devolution settlement because they're not simply allowing the executive to balance its budget as it wishes. It's insisting on an arbitrary amount of revenue raising and that is not constructive to budget sustainability. And even if parties were agreed around any of those quite punitive measures, it would take years for to actually implement some of them in practice. So even if parties wanted to do so, you couldn't meet the government's conditions on that basis. So I think the government's ask is completely unrealistic and I think there will be a negotiation that will continue with Treasury on that basis. OK, need to leave it there. Thank you both very much indeed for uh, coming in to join us on the um, programme tonight. Let's just tease out some of those ideas a bit further. Um, Sir Robert Choate is uh, still here and he's joined by the former head of the Civil Service, uh, Sir David Sterling, the chief executive of the Belfast Chamber, Claire Guinness, and the commentator, Newton Emerson. So welcome to all of you and thank you um, for coming in to join us. I, I don't know if we're actually going to get any, any answers or solutions to um, what seem to be quite... Uh, difficult and some might say impenetrable issues. David Sterling, you, you, you've been dealing with this issue, this issue for a very, very long time. These ministers are on day 12 of uh, another fledgling executive. And it's clear from their perspective they're pushing back against any attempt to hurt those, we've heard it repeatedly on the programme tonight, against those who are already struggling, as they see it, with the cost of living crisis. Are our politicians, first of all, right to try to hold that line? Can you see why they're doing that? We've been here before, and I can perfectly well understand why they are adopting the stance that they are. I think the focus on revenue raising has been a bit of distraction from what is really important at the moment. And I think what is really important is that the new executive uh, begins the process of determining its priorities, looking at what is needed really to improve our public services, creating a draft programme for government and a budget that underpins that. Now, I think when they've done that, they will need to identify how they are going to pay for all the things that need to be done. And I think it's in that context they're going to need to look at the transformation of services, which is uh, so, you know, so much needed in so many services. They're going to need to look at reform. But I think they're also going to need to look at that stage. Okay. Is there any need to raise some revenue, additional revenue locally so, to do the things we want to do? So, so we know, we heard our politicians saying that, that the issue of revenue raising was discussed during the talks process that led to the £3.3 .3 billion package being put on the table. But yet, uh, you, you do have to wonder if the UK government has bowled a bit of a googly here to this new executive, because mm -hmm. um, Neil Gibson said at that meeting yesterday, the Permanent Secretary of the Department of Finance, the first he heard specifically about the £113 million ask by May was yesterday morning. Yeah, well, look, I think what we're seeing here is the UK government has been in this position before. Uh, we've had budgetary crises in Northern Ireland on several occasions over the last 10 or 20 years. And I think the UK government at the moment is uh, taking the steps it feels it needs to take to ensure that a sustainable uh, financial future is put in place to support public services here. Now, it's quite clear that there is a disagreement between our local politicians and the UK government over this. There will be negotiations around this. 
Uh, I'm not sure at the moment from what I'm hearing that the Treasury is in, going to be in a rush to give significantly on finances. But certainly I can see there may be scope for agreeing that a longer time is needed to produce, for example, the sustainability plan. I think there'll be debate around that. And I think going back to Sir Robert's point earlier, I think there's still a lack of clarity about when the new one pound 24 yeah. um, uh, ceiling or floor, whichever we want to look at, <coughs> comes in. Um, I think there's scope for debate around that. But I think the most important thing is that the executive doesn't become preoccupied, <coughs> excuse me, with a battle with the Treasury, that it needs to focus on, as I say, developing this programme for government, taking forward the reform and transformation of public services, which are so badly needed. Claire Guinness, what does business want to come out of this? Let's call it a conversation rather than an argument at the moment. I mean, do you want our politicians to hold the line? Or do you think they need to demonstrate that they are fiscally responsible and that they are mature and that they can deliver a balanced budget and that they can run the affairs of Northern Ireland effectively? And if that means they have to engage in some level of revenue raising, then that's what they should do. Well, I think we absolutely do need to show that we are we can balance the books and that we can we can run this um, you know region in a in a in a positive way um, financially. However, I just think the timing of this. I think the the I think it's great to see the the assembly back up and running. I think that's given business a real sense of optimism. And I think at the same time as we've got that real sense of renewed optimism, we then get hit with these potential punitive measures. The timing just couldn't be worse as far as I'm concerned and, and I think that's the sentiment in business in terms of, you know, today we got the news the UK economy's in recession and at the same time as we get that news we're, we're talking about actually, you know, raising um, the cost of business. The costs of business are already um, really high. You know, we talk about the cost of living crisis. We think about that from a co consumer perspective. But of course, from a business perspective, the cost of energy, the cost of wages, uh, transportation, it just doesn't feel like the right time to increase the costs on either businesses or the consumer. Um, and of course, if the costs on the consumer are increased, then they presumably have less money to spend in the businesses on the high street. Of course, there'll be a multiplier effect because if 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 if, if taxes are raised or if, if if you know there's less money in the economy, there'll be less money to spend on the high street. There'll be less money to spend in hospitality, tourism, and we already know that all of these sectors are already challenged. It's just couldn't be the worst time to be having this conversation. Um, Newton, can you square the circle? Well, I think that, uh, yes, the timing, is, <clears throat> the timing is very bad. It's very tight. And Stormont ministers have a point that really they need to talk about this in the round and work out a sustainable plan. And it is a bit, a bit absurd to have to cough up this 113 million in a, in a month or two. It can't be a surprise because the 15% rates figure was reported in December. Yeah. But just how far back this has gone is worth noting. This exact language on revenue raising and considering revenue raising was in new decade, new approach, fresh start, the Stormont House agreements, that's going back a full decade, all tied to the Treasury, offering more money to help with public service reform, but wanting a demonstration that Stormont would play some part. And I think that that's key to what's happening now. They just want a token demonstration that they can help with the public uh, service reform that Northern Ireland is going to need. But it's not just going to be a case of Stormont asking and London giving. They want someone to work with them. And we need some demonstration of that. I understand that there's a negotiation going on and the parties want to hold the line at this stage, but ruling everything out, as they have more or less done at this point, is counterproductive. They need to give some kind of signal to London that they can be flexible. Yeah, I mean, I just wonder what kind of hand you think our local politicians have in this negotiation, because if the executive holds to this line and says, we're not going to do anything to raise £113 million, then potentially, if the Treasury holds to it line, its line, there is a serious consequence. And the cliff face that Sir Robert Choate is talking about um, <laughs> looks bigger uh, and, and seems closer. Ultimately, Stormont ministers think London isn't going to allow public services here to collapse. And they're right. In that staring contest, usually they win. But what also happens is they don't get the extra investment they want from London to help with public sector reform so that we can really get onto a sustainable footing. And so everyone's in this staring contest. They both think they're winning but we're all losing, and it's gone on now for a full decade. Yeah. Um, 
Sir Robert, I, suppose I, I have to ask you, first of all, having heard what you've just heard from your fellow panellists on this table and from our politicians across the studio floor, um, are, are you now m more optimistic about this place or less <laughs> optimistic? <laughs> Uh, I'm about as optimistic as I was beforehand. I think the, uh, the, uh, uh, the point on the, the timing issue is clearly an interesting one. I think in terms of, as you say, um, uh, the Department of Finance saying that they were surprised by this, I think this element of, of how quickly do you need to decide, how quickly do you need to implement, Newsom said the idea of needing revenue raising of roughly this amount or you know, of something equivalent to a 15% increase in the rates was around in the earlier discussions of this, uh, this package. So whether the Treasury is willing to move on that, I don't know. But I think in the, uh, uh, as, uh, as Newton said, there's this notion, I think, in their mind that it's appropriate to have a degree of burden sharing here. Uh, there is clearly a challenge. Uh, they, you know, they know that you can't hold uh, Northern Ireland to a situation where you're going to end up with public services collapsing. But some uh, movement on both sides, I think they think is a reasonable uh, thing to do. And then obviously it's for the parties to decide um, how they try to negotiate uh, in that in that environment. Yeah, I mean, I mean the, st the strange thing about this is that, I mean, some people may look at it and say, um, you've got Stormont executive minister saying, we're not prepared to look at the uh, the, the regional rate and, and, and increasing that by 15%. But yet we've got councillors right across Northern Ireland in the last week who have voted for, from the main parties, who have voted for the district rate to be increased in some cases by almost 10%. Indeed, um, and, and some of the comments actually in councils have been interesting, you know, where they've, those who've been arguing for the rate increase have been saying that um, if you want high quality public services, you're going to have to pay for them. And I think there is a message there that it resonates. But I think the other thing we need to recognise is that we're six, seven weeks away from the start of the next financial year. And for those ministers and senior officials who are managing public services, public services that are in crisis. It's really, really important that a budget is agreed quickly. So in this regard, I think the executive doesn't really have the clout and the levers that it perhaps might like to have to persuade the Treasury to move on these things in the time available. So it's going to be interesting to see just how the executive pushes the points it's making over the next couple of weeks. Sending letters to the Treasury is going to have limited impact. There's going to need to be face-to-face -face contact. Yeah, and of course, um, you're here tonight as a former head of the Northern Ireland Civil Service, and civil servants have carried a heavy burden, and you've made the point in this studio many times in, in recent months that it was unreasonable and undemocratic for those civil servants to be asked to do the job that they were doing. At the moment, of course, they are now taking instructions from elected representatives again from ministers so they have to do as 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 they're told effectively indeed they're under the direction and control of their ministers yeah so if the if the if the ministers as members of the northern ireland political parties who aren't happy with what's been offered by the treasury tell them to write more letters to draft more letters to hold the line that is what they're going to have to do that will be the the agreed northern ireland position indeed uh, although at the same time um, officials will be advising ministers of the importance of having an agreed budget in place before the start of the financial year as well, just because the, in the absence of that, it's going to be really hard to deal with the huge pressures that all public services are facing. Um, Newton, can I just ask you a little bit more about the politics of this? Because, because I know it's something that, that, that you're interested in, that you write about, and um, the apparent contradiction, as some people might see it, of uh, members of the executive on the one hand saying, we're, we're not going to raise the regional rate, but yet councillors across the country um, raising the uh, the district rate. Um, we, we had a meeting last night at uh, of Derry City and Straban District Council, and there was a Sinn Féin councillor, uh, Councillor Paul Boggs, um, and it's reported in today's Telegraph, said, I fail to see how people can say we want X, Y and Z, but aren't willing to pay for it. No one wants to raise the rates, but if we want first-class public services, we have to pay for them. If you want any sign that Stormont might be able to agree these kind of, uh, this kind of budget, then that meeting is very instructive. Sinn Féin voted that rate to increase through entirely on its own. It faced criticism from every other party, uh, the SDLP, People for Profit, U the UUP voted against it. The DUP abstained, interestingly, which I think might be an indication of how it might behave at Stormont. But uh, the argument from the, uh, the SDLP was there's a fund to help with the rates at Stormont, and that could be used to make the rates budget lower. So it was a lot of a lot of buck passing going on there. And Sinn Féin, the councillors in Sinn Féin anyway, stood their ground 
uh, even in a constituency that's very important for them in the next general election, they put that in. So there is proof that Sinn Féin can do this. Why can't they do it at Stormont? Yeah. So, so does that qualify, as far as you're concerned, as, as mixed messaging? No, no, that's a, that's a good sign. They haven't sent this message from Stormont yet. They're still they're still. Well, the message from Stormont is that we're not going to raise rates, well, but the, the message on the ground is we are raising the, rates. Uh, the, the deadline had, had, had arrived in Derry. <laughs> they had to make the call and they made the only call that they could there. So perhaps they will eventually do that at Stormont as well. Yeah. Um, Claire Gibbs, I, I know you're concerned about business and you're concerned uh, about the high street and there are potentially mm -hmm. rates implications as far as that's concerned. Um, there are lots of pots of money that could be used to make up that £113 million mm. if the principal is conceded by the executive. I just wanted to ask you about one of them because I think it's, it's, it's something I'd be interested to know your view on. Um, a lot of talk about bringing in more revenue from domestic rates, mm. but um, removing industrial derating, as I mentioned in the previous conversation, could bring in over £70 million to the finance department. And people might be wondering, why should factories continue to benefit from a 70% discount? on their rates. Yeah, it's a good it's a good point, Mark. And actually, it's the one that I, actually I've got most issue with um, because, you know, if you, if you think about what we're trying to do, we're trying to grow our economy, we're trying to grow our rates base, we're trying to grow the revenue for Northern Ireland on a sustainable basis. And that word's used an awful lot in, 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 in context of these discussions. And I don't think it's sustainable to increase the costs of manufacturing businesses in Northern Ireland. Manufacturing businesses in Northern Ireland are already, you know, um, you know, kind of disadvantaged because of our scale and our geography. We've already got higher energy costs, and we have to be competitive as a region. And I think when we want to really try and and grow um, because of the the dual market access and this exciting e economic zone that we've got, and the assembly's back up and running, and everything looks very positive for growth. And then at the same time as it's positive for growth, we're going to say to the hundred thousand. Um, there's 100,000 people employed in manufacturing here. It's worth over a billion pound of the economy. And we're going to say to those employers, we're putting your rates up. And their rates will go up quite substantially and make most of them uncompetitive. So at the same time as we're trying to raise revenue, we need to understand the impact of what some of those measures might do to the existing businesses and what that will also do in terms of making us attractive to get investment and jobs into Northern Ireland, because that's what we really want to do on the back of the dual market access, on the back of the new assembly. And that's what we want to do in the medium and the long term to make this place properly sustainable. So a short term fix for 100 million quid feels like it's a mistake. OK, just, just a quick um, word from both of you at this end of the table, if, if you would. Uh, Deirdre Hargy raised the issue of um, tax varying powers um, so that the, the, the full suite of levers could be pulled by the executive in future. Should that be on the table? A personal view is if they can't agree uh, to introduce uh, water charges, which are a fairly progressive charge, or to increase the regional rate, which again is progressive, I, I don't see them really ever being in a position to agree on rates of income tax here in Northern Ireland. Purely a personal view. OK, so, so Robert, I mean, if, if the executive isn't prepared to make the decisions that some people think need to be made at this stage, um, does it make sense to have those additional powers granted by Westminster in the short term, in your view? Well, I think one of the challenges, if you do do this, you also take on additional risk as well as the ability to move the levers. As we saw with corporation tax uh, in the past. Yes, and you've and seen you've seen this story both with Scotland and yep. Wales, where essentially uh, taking on more tax raising powers has actually worked out quite well for Wales, but less well for Scotland because they've ended up losing money and, have, in a sense, had to raise taxes in order to stand still. So that's not a reason not to do it if you want to have more decisions taken locally, but it doesn't come without risk. Okay, like all things. It's more complicated than it maybe looks initially. Uh, we will leave it there, folks. Thank you all very much indeed for uh, joining us tonight. Uh, there's no Sunday politics this weekend, but we'll be back at the usual time next Thursday. And look out for the latest red lines on Wednesday on BBC Sounds or wherever you get your podcasts. For now, though, from all of us, bye-bye.